Well, this morning, um, it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Nikki Kasumi Clements to Connections. Um, Nikki is in my own department, Department of Religion. She's been here six full years. She's in her seventh year. I'm hoping today we can talk about her life, why she got into the study of religion or the humanities more generally. She happens to study the most cited um, writer in the, all of the humanities, Michel Foucault. I hope we hear about Foucault as well. And then kind of branch out of that into the broader topics of pedagogy or teaching and, and the humanities in, in the public realm. So, so welcome, Nikki. Thank you so much, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you, almost uh, in person. <laughs> almost, oh alas. Um, well, listen. Let's start. Let's start with your with your life, with your your autobiographical narrative, and how how you got to be sitting in that chair in that room on this particular day, talking to this goofball. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jeff. Well, the. Uh, Story of my life, I guess we're going to have to bring back to Oakland, California, Highland Hospital. I'm born into the delivery room in 1981 to the music of Swan Lake, which my parents had intentionally put on. And this is important only insofar as on my third birthday, I started my first ballet class, and that was my training, my way of life. It was my profession from a very young age, and I was uh, pre-professionally trained as a ballerina. I was in um, pre-professional companies. I was trained at San Francisco Ballet, Oakland Ballet. And it was really in the classroom at the bar where I learned formation and transformation as well as on the stage and performance where you bring all of that training and you bring it all together and you can't possibly think about what you're doing technically anymore and you simply have to express. You simply have to be there present completely, not only for yourself, but also with your audience. So this experience as a dancer changed the way that I related to the world in so many ways, intellectually, as well as personally, politically, ethically. And I'll get into that in a minute. But I just wanted to set that as context, because for me, the experience of the world was deeply embodied. It was deeply embodied, it was deeply effective, and it was also always in community. There was never an I, there was only a we. My we, in this case, was my mother who came from Japan. She grew up in Kyushu in a Jodo Shinshu temple. Her father and all of her ancestors on the male side were Jodo Shinshu Buddhist priests, as my uncle is now in Kyushu. And my father was a New Age Catholic who came of age in the 60s and 70s in Berkeley. And so I grew up in the Bay Area, uh, surrounded by both Buddhist and Catholic inheritances, surrounded by uh, queer ballerinas in San Francisco, as well as uh, Catholic nuns in the East Bay. And so it was really an exercise in paradox and contradiction in a certain narrative saying that my mother was damned, that she, who was the best person that I knew, was wrong that myself as a queer person, that the people I was dancing with in San Francisco in the Bay Area were wrong. There is a sense that being different, both on the basis of uh, my own identity, in terms of culture, in terms of ethnicity, in terms of race, in terms of gender, in terms of class, because we lived in a very affluent town, but we ourselves were very, very not. And this sense of recognizing my contingency on so many different structures and forms of power and the ways in which I benefited from scholarships and from community and was just exposed and embraced by so many worlds in which I knew that I was not the norm and yet I could also be a translator between these different communities between my parents, between my um, queer artist selves and communities, and my, my Catholic upbringing, on the other hand. So this is the broader context with three younger sisters, a really keen sense of what it is to be in community, to struggle, to engage in formation because there is something at stake politically and personally. And also the daily practice, 
the pleasures of daily practice, centering oneself through that as a way to counteract a lot of the struggles that were also happening at that time. So Nikki, Nikki, can I, can I ask a couple questions at this point? I, I, first of all, I'm like, wow, that is so not my upbringing. <laughs> that is so not Nebraska in the 1970s and 80s, um, which is fascinating. Yeah, which is fascinating. That's a, but that's not a question. That's just a, that's just a comment. Um, what were your parents doing playing Swan Lake? Was was that was that intentional to like set the set the tone? Was your mom a dancer? Or your dad a dancer? Or? No, it was just an appreciation. My dad really wanted to play this for some reason, and. Um, my mother just wanted to get me out of her. So there was no intentionality. There was no desire for me to be a dancer. It, by the age of two, I was running around, seeing ballet, and my parents had no idea why I wanted to do this. Or certainly by the age of three, why I would want to do this so seriously. By the age of six, I was dancing six days out of the week, multiple hours a day. And What's there, uh, Was there any Disney in there? No, that's the thing that I find really um, striking. So Disney, ballet as this pretty form of princessdom and uh, female gender identity, none of that interested me. I did not care about being pretty as such. I did not want to be reduced to my body. I did not care about living a fantasy. I loved the struggle, the pain, the discipline, and then the excess. The feeling of being so present and feeling that kind of integration in myself that I couldn't feel the rest of my life because I was constantly navigating contradictions. What do you make of that? I mean, there's, there's a kind of precociousness there that's pretty obvious. I mean, if I, if I were a Hindu or a Buddhist of some type, I would say that this is you know, some kind of other life that's kind of coming through early on. Um, I mean, and I don't want to go there. I'm just, I'm just offering that as one cultural explanation. But, you know, this is not what most three-year-olds do, uh, in case you didn't know. <laughs> I know now. I didn't know at the time. <laughs> I, I, I agree. My parents both have these more extra ordinary worldviews. So they were convinced that my mother has this typology of the shining princess from Japanese folklore. My father has this intergenerational Catholic saintdom, his spirit guides, and they think that I chose to be in this body with them on this earth plane. Okay, so I'm not far from your parents' understanding. Exactly. <laughs> you guys would get along. <laughs> we're, so were both parents fairly religious in a, or in a kind of casual cultural way? It was a very deliberate disengagement on the part of my mother. She uh, fled Kyushu because she didn't want to be a temple girl. And she didn't want that way of life, which was extremely restricted on the basis of gender and very hierarchical. And so she fled to Tokyo, and then she fled to the United States, where she took an English class, where my father was the instructor. And then she went back to Japan. He went back to get her six months later. And then I was born. <laughs> so her parents disowned her. She was so you no were, longer you, recognized. You were born from a pedagogical experience. An experiment. <laughs> <laughs> OK, we we'll probably shouldn't go that. We we'll probably should not go in that direction. Uh, all right, so you're a ballerina. How long did this last? Uh, so this uh, lasted until I was uh, 16 in terms of very serious ballet. I had a very serious set of injuries, and so I moved to um, other forms of modern, and I continued to do ballet, but I just knew I was never going to join San Francisco Ballet Company, for example. So this was a shift in artistic practice, and it was also a social shift because I started teaching at that stage when I was 15, 16, and I was working three jobs. I was deeply immers uh, immersed in the kind of cultural world of, um, of the town that I grew up in. So it was uh, an embrace of community while knowing that I had a function. So it was really important there. I went to college in order to study dance as well as academics. So that's why I went to Sarah Lawrence College. I went to New York City adjacent 
without having the desire and commitment and courage, I think, at that point to just go for a company or um, I made it to the last stage in uh, Juilliard or Tisch and I didn't commit to, to pursuing that and waiting a year. So I went to Sarah Lawrence in order to do both the academics and the dance. Was Sarah, was, was Sarah Lawrence at that time still all an all-female school? No, I did already. I did already, okay. Yeah, with the GI Bill, they had actually made it open, but it was still a predominantly split campus, 70-30, you'd say, female to male ratio. But of course, it was also a very queer campus, so female-male doesn't quite cut it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> understood. Okay, so I assume at some point you go to graduate school, at least I hope at some point you go to graduate school. Um, <laughs> uh, Otherwise, otherwise, we have a problem. <laughs> what am here. I doing here? Yeah. Um, so obviously, you go, to gra you go to graduate school. Can you tell us about that decision? Sure. Um, so in the wake of having my final injury my junior year in college and a big kind of existential chasm opened up, personally, it was also a time when I was living in uh, the southern Bronx. I was commuting into the city and up to school and... It was in this context that I took my first philosophy class, and it was a, a class that focused on empathy and the possibilities and the impossibilities of empathy. How does the universal relate to the particular? And we were thinking about this through Simone Weil, the French uh, philosopher of the 20th century, but her engagement with the pre-Socratic philosophers and Plato and uh, Homer's Iliad as a poem of might and the ways in which we're constantly navigating similar questions of how do we act towards each other? How do we act towards ourselves? And so it was a very philosophical and abstract conversation. But then the next morning, I woke up as the planes crashed into the uh, um, World Trade Center downtown. I could see it from my window. I saw it on the TV screen, mirrored. And I saw the not only the collapse and the rebuilding of a certain sense of identity in New York City in particular, as well as a national identity that became so violent and terrifying. But I also felt personally that these philosophical questions matter. They have real stakes. They have consequences for so many people, both those who were directly affected that day and for the countless costs of war that was inaugurated the following year. And so between 2001 and 9-11, when I'm really coming into this philosophical life, and 2003, where all the goodwill that was extended towards the United States was then channeled into war. And I watched with my philosophy professor and mentor, Alfie Raymond, um, on the TV as the invasion of Iraq is happening in 2003. I watched as the religious rhetoric of evil was promulgated by Bush. I watched as the descent into the conditions that we are now wrestling with in very real and acute ways were set up. And so th for me, philosophy was not an abstract exercise, but instead a very real political and ethical reality. And that was why I wanted to study philosophy, because it helped me understand the world around me, both in a broader cosmic sense of where I was situated there was no meaning in my life, and so I knew I had to create it. And so I pursued this sense of truth, and that's why I went to graduate school, Harvard Divinity School, as I told you before, because I really wanted to figure out the nature of things. I wanted to figure out how did we get to this space? How do we dehumanize and vilify each other in these discrete as well as institutional and infrastructural ways? At Harvard Divinity School, then, I studied the broader history of Western thought, because I wanted to fill in this broader narrative. I wanted to see what the conditions of emergence were. And uh, it's funny to think about going to divinity school to find truth, because <laughs> I wasn't looking for a religious truth as such, in part because all these religions had different claims to truth, and they were irreconcilable and in conflict and mobilized in ways that worked as ciphers for underlying issues that were economic and political and violent. So it was the weaponization of religion that I realized in a very experiential way that I was then trying to unpack by
by understanding our histories of violence and how we actually can think critically about where we are today. And so at Harvard, instead of learning what we can know in terms of truth, I had to turn to what we can do. Right? The, the conflicts were too intractable. And so that's why I turned to ethics and this question of not what can we know for certain and therefore found our sense of ethics and morality on, but instead, what can we do day to day? What are the basic practices that shape us? And this is where it goes back to the formation as a ballerina and a dancer very early on, because my readings in uh, ethics and forms of subjectivity and what it is to be a self were split in two primary ways. On the one hand, you have this narrative that the self is something that is autonomous and self-determining and a moral legislature. Uh, this is Immanuel Kant's very um, important contribution. But um, I knew I wasn't autonomous. I knew I was not free in any sense that was uh, robust. Instead, I was constrained by all kinds of circumstances, and you work in and through that. On the other hand, you have post-structuralist accounts of uh, human agency and the human subject, where subjects are shaped in and through the social conditions at hand, the economic realities, the political manipulations, the educational opportunities that one has, and the, the ways within which we are shaped as certain subjects in order to contribute to forms of power and domination was then stripping us of agency. So between these two, of autonomy and determination, I knew that I had to find something more robust in day to day. Nikki, can I translate you for a moment? I mean, yeah. I'm just th I'm thinking of our listeners. You know, so the, t the academic way of, of talking about this is what you've been doing, is to talk about agency and subjectivity and the formation of subjectivity and the limitations of agency. And, and, but I think how most people might better understand that is you know, kind of the simplistic question whether we have free will or not. And so can you translate what you're saying into a, a set of answers to that question? And I know, I know you don't have... We, no one has a clear answer on that question, but there are a set of answers, right, that are, that are available in Kant, that are available in Nietzsche and Foucault, and you know, this, whole, this whole line of thought that you're, 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 you're articulating. And I'm just trying, I want to bring it back to kind of to, uh, to people who are not in the academy and who are, really, who are really interested, the people for whom these philosophical debates matter. The people watching 9-11, the buildings collapse. Um, how does this relate to that? This is where my friend John Cashin comes into play. <laughs> <laughs> Good, let's go there. <laughs> and this book that was the product of 10 years of intensive thought and reflection because Cashin is dealing with a very similar question, which is uh, how do we have any ability to shape ourselves? in a world that has so much suffering and contingency and where it seems like what we do doesn't matter. So he is working through this question of human effort and how our human effort matters, how it matters in ways that are very, very limited but can still have very real effects. So think about COVID, <laughs> quarantine the last seven months, to give away the fact that we're talking in uh, October, and the way in which our daily practices have had to change. The question of human effort has dilated in this way where we have to rethink the way in which we uh, navigate the day-to-day. -day. We have to rethink our practices, and we know that our options are limited. We know that the structures around us have precluded certain options, and so the question is, what do you do from here? In this world of struggle, what can you do? And for Cashin, he's thinking about this from a theological perspective as well. He's a contemporary of Augustine, and Augustine is really trying to protect divine agency, divine grace, the force of grace. And free will is too problematic. right? Free will in itself seems too free. And instead of having this split, Cashin has a more practical answer to human effort because he's dealing in very practical contexts. 
he's not writing for the philosophers or the theologians. He's writing to monastics. He's writing to people who are trying to create community. He's writing to particular monks who are concerned and have feelings and struggle with different spirits and passions. They struggle with nocturnal emissions. They struggle with envy. They struggle with this very ancient emotion called akadia in uh, the Greek, which is a, a kind of listlessness, a torpor, and also the precursor to uh, modern uh, massive depressive disorder. And of course, we see the rise in uh, mental health concerns during quarantine, the rise in uh, instances of depression, particularly amongst college-age students who have come of age in this time of uh, constant war and economic um, precarity. So in terms of human effort and agency, what can we do? Our options are limited, but it doesn't mean that we have no options. It doesn't mean that we give up, because if we give up, well, there's one way out, but it's not pleasant. So if I, again, if I can translate. So the question is, do we have free will or not? I mean, it's posed in a binary way. And I hear you saying we sort of do, but not as much as we probably think we do, but we can still do something about it. Yeah, I don't like the language of freedom. I don't talk about free will. I don't like the language of the will, in part because of the inheritance that we have today that prioritizes the will. I was uh, working with my students yesterday on Descartes' Passions of the Soul and his cogito and the sense of the will and how we need to move this meat machine of the body <laughs> in order to, um, to exert our force. But we don't have that kind of freedom. We don't have that kind of will. The will in itself is precarious and it's contingent. So I don't think about free will. Instead, I think about human effort. And this book was actually written for um, my dear friend who um, committed suicide. And the book was written in so many ways in order to figure out what is it that we can do when our will fails us, when the will in itself is not reliable, when uh, through factors of mental health as well as societal factors of shame and queer shaming, et cetera, there is this sense that there are no options. And so instead, I turned not to what the will can do, but instead, what are the daily supports that the body can help you through? What are the kinds of affective supports you can find? What are the kinds of communal sources we can have in intimate relationships as well as broader social? So to, so to, to bring this again into the present and to kind of put a fine point on it or maybe a magic marker on it, I mean, I think this is actually one of the, the touching points or the points where intellectual students, faculty trained in the humanities are at significant odds, frankly, with a lot of the public. Um, I, I certainly share all your views. What you just articulated is pretty much my worldview. But the implications of it are that people are not actually as responsible for their, their situations and their actions as we want to imagine they are. And so much of our legal system and certainly our, our criminal system is based on punishing people because they are responsible. And our economic system presumes that essentially people are poor because they're lazy. Um, so there's, there's a whole political philosophy out there that assumes the exact opposite of everything you're saying, um, or everything I suppose we're trying to say, we're trying to problematize these assumptions, right? That people are really as free and as responsible as we want to imagine they are. And, you know, I think a sociologist would talk a lot like you do too, Nikki. I don't think it's just the humanities. I think it's the social sciences as well. We're all so keenly aware of how little free will, to use those terms, uh, people have. So how do you, how, how do you deal with that? I mean, clearly you must feel that. I do, and this brings me to Michel Foucault, who, as you mentioned at the beginning of our hour, is the most cited researcher in the humanities as well as the social sciences. So he has this outsized impact across all of these discourses in part because he helps us see the ways in which 
society is shaped, how power conditions so many of uh, the options that we have as individuals. And that Foucault himself is uh, coming of age in France during the 20th century. He dies in 1984, um, and he is uh, navigating his own Catholic background as a gay man in a time when it was um, criminalized and uh, when not illegal, certainly censured by common norms. And so the way that Foucault is thinking about how we do not have free will, we do not have some fiction of the free will because we are already shaped as subjects. But if we don't recognize that we have some capacity to act, some capacity to shape ourselves, and be critical of the conditions of our own shaping societally, then what are we doing this for? He says in 1980, in his uh, archives in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, um, what he says publicly in Vermont in 1982, which is, perhaps I insisted too much on the techniques of domination. <laughs> I'm more and more interested in the relation that the self has to the self because Foucault theorizes the way within which we are subjects conditioned by society and these institutions like the clinic, by the asylum, by the uh, uh, prison, and how the prison ends up becoming a model for education, for other forms of uh, a social convening. And so Foucault is already thinking about how are we shaped in ways that are beyond our consciousness and control. And so this question of responsibility is one that is really important here because the question of ethics is a question of how do we take responsibility for the ways in which we can act, not just for ourselves, but our responsibility then to be critical of the very institutions that have precluded the options for so many. So it's a responsibility that amplifies instead of minimizes. So isn't that a dilemma of sorts or a contradiction even. I mean, so so much of, of our, so many of our assumptions in the humanities is that whatever free will we have, it's very limited and very partial. And yet he gets interested at the end of his life in precisely emphasizing that tiny part which we seem to have some control over and have some freedom over, as it were. So there's a kind of both and there, right? There's there's, we're completely dominated by structures of power and forms of knowledge are really just forms of power. They're forms of discipline. And yet, we need to act. We need, we, we, we need to subvert these, these uh, regimes of truth and power and governmentality that we find ourselves in. It seems to me there's a tension there. Certainly. And it's a tension that he was very actively working through in the last decade of his life. And I'll, I'll visualize this a bit, because the model that you're just describing has a little bit of human effort within the framework of these forms of social and control <laughs> that have also been supported by and produced in turn, these forms of knowledge. And so our capacity to act only operates in this little sphere. But for Foucault, he is working through the question of how do we understand these things not as nesting dolls, but instead these axes. So you have uh, the axis of the way in which power is shaping you. So here, here's, here's the dilemma I see. And, and it's, like we, <laughs> it's like we can work in these little tiny little, little divots in this broad system that we have no control over. And yet, he's essentially trying to take down the whole system. Yeah, because it's not that any individual can change the system, but it's not that the system can't change. It always changes. Right. The system, like any institution, is inherently conservative insofar as it wants to protect itself. It wants to mobilize its values to meet certain kinds of objective and ends, now in the world of financial capitalism, uh, purely economic ones. But the fact is that we not only have the capacity to shape ourselves, but we can critique these institutions. We right. can change them. And this is right. what's happening with the brave people who have been out protesting since the murder of George Floyd. This has been happening since Occupy Wall Street in 2009, when you have the very visible sense of the economic crisis that's happening. We have the capacity to act. And the question is, how do we not just remain as subjects of power, 
but instead start to shape ourselves in ways that subvert those norms, that challenge the kinds of expectations of who we're supposed to be and how we're supposed to act in ways that then open up new possibilities. Yeah. Right? Gay marriage was not on the table when Foucault was alive. And it is now, right, as of 2015, 2020, who's, <laughs> we'll see what happens in 2021, but you know, I, I couldn't have gotten married to my female partner when we were together a decade ago. And so these things change, but they change because individuals are able to not only shape themselves, but to apply pressure, to critique the forms of power. And this is what is that amplification of responsibility. It's a responsibility that we have to each other to make good on our rhetorical aims. We do not have equal protection under the law. We do not have the uh, application of human rights. We have the criminalization instead of so many black and brown people. We have uh, disenfranchisement of voter rights. We have mass incarceration. We have police violence. We have all of these structures that also need to change because individuals are speaking up with their voices, with their bodies en masse. People are dying for this, and that matters. So this is, a, this is a nice segue into pedagogy. I mean, is this, is this how you understand pedagogy? Is, I mean, it, it's, it sounds to me like your model of social change is lots of people acting on the system and changing it either dramatically and instantly or gradually and slowly, d depending on, I suppose, depending on the system and, and how many people are acting. Um, so, I mean, I, I personally think, Nikki, that this is just a paradox or a dilemma in the humanities. We, we seem to think that individuals don't have much capacity to change the system, and yet I think individually we all, not maybe all of us, but some of us want to change the world. You know, we have very, very uh, maybe, maybe megalomaniacal views of our scholarship. I know I do, personally. I'm speaking for myself, not you. Um, I want to change the world. I want to, actually, I want to change reality. That's what I really want to change. Um, and yet, I, I completely agree with you that we're so bound by all of these economic and political and legal and, frankly, religious forces that, that uh, we're completely unaware of. And they're powerful to the extent we're not conscious of them. So what do we do in the classroom then? Let's kind of, let's push out now. We, I think we've, we've got the basic idea or the basic model. What, why teach? It's that dialectic between individual formation and institutional transformation that I think is so central to teaching as well as my research and service, which is the kind of third academic prong. But we teach because individuals do matter. And I realized that my, um, my superpower, uh, I realized when I was a PhD student, graduate student at Brown University, and I started working in the dean of the college office. And I, for five years, helped mentor and shape students who were applying for Rhodes Fellowships, Fulbright, uh, Marshall. And I was also teaching, and so I had these uh, students that I was working with, and it was a students who felt like they didn't have a voice or felt like their space or their position didn't have any kind of legibility. They didn't feel like they had that sense of authority. And those were the students that I worked with, that I pulled out. And I realized that it's the capacity to help people find the meaning of their own lives, um, which is something that Viktor Frankl talks about very meaningfully, that the core of my own pedagogy comes back to. How does the capacity for you to see another individual, another student as a human being, to see their interests, their drives, their capacities, their potentials, and to help them realize it themselves. It's that act of agency, that act of human agency that we can actually, and only really, start to uh, open up in relation. So with students then, they are going to go on to shape policies. They are going to go on to vote. They are going to go on to create uh, big corporations. And the question is, uh, what kinds of uh, frameworks are they carrying with them? What kinds of awareness are they uh, carrying with them? And this is one of the other ways in which institutional change is both inevitable 
And the more that we can do within these educational systems to be intentional about what people are aware of critically, while also thinking empathetically about the need to humanize others and not reduce them to numbers or stats or other kinds of objects. That's what we bring from the classroom out into the world. So what, what do you say to um, a student who takes one of your courses that you know, the student basically, I mean, the student basically says, well, you're challenging my worldview, or you're, you're questioning my belief system. What, what do you say to that? Well, I do not proselytize. I don't want anybody to believe anything. As such, I am giving them tools, critical tools for thinking and analyzing the world. They are challenging themselves if their worldview is changing. It means that they're listening. It means that they're engaging in this practice seriously. And I do my best then to help them navigate the tensions and the differences. But I'm not here to tell them what to think. This is one of those truisms that we say, right? We do not tell you what to think. We tell you how to think. <laughs> but telling someone how to think, of course, encodes what to think along the way. This is why the, uh, the liberal professor is, uh, is such a dominant um, category. But I, I don't. <sighs> I mean, it's, it's a struggle because the students whose uh, views of the world are changing, whenever they come to me, most oftentimes it is a, a reflection and a, a sense of, of need to talk about it because they feel like they are now at odds maybe with their family, with their friends, with the world around them, with themselves. So it's a displacement. Yeah, but it's a displacement that they also feel is challenging and can be terrifying, but ultimately helps them reintegrate. And so what I think we do as educators is help our students think critically and empathetically in order to figure out their place in the world and how they can contribute maximally. Do you, do you think, Nick, Nikki, I mean, of course everything you're saying rings, rings true to me, but we're both, we're both at a private, secular research university working in a very privileged space with very, very smart young people. How do we do this outside, you know, beyond the hedges, as we say here? Or what, what do we say on CNN? You know, or what, what do we say when we move outside the, you know, this community that, I mean, people who never heard of Michel Foucault or wouldn't understand, you know, a third of the words you, you've been using um, seriously, I mean, they just wouldn't. Um, it would just go pew, you know? This is um, my fault. No, it's not your fault. It's not your fault, and, and it's not my fault either. This is how we were trained to think and speak, and because of it, we can speak and think about things that other people can't speak and think about. There's a, there's a value in technical language. But, I, the, but my question, though, is how do we talk about these ideas without our technical language. You see what I'm getting at? Well, I took two questions from what you were just saying. The first I was preparing to answer, which is the way within which we create broader change in order to think through education, not just at the collegiate level, but instead K through 12 education. How are we thinking about education across this country? How are we training students to think? How do we recognize the not just utility, but the vitality and the necessity of the humanities for thinking about humans. <laughs> humans in history, humans in literature, humans in uh, the uh, clinical office. Right? This impacts all the other dimensions of um, you know, STEM education and professions that students here are being trained to, to engage. So on this first point of uh, what do we do? How do we think about a public facing humanities? How do we uh, think about what we're doing in these classrooms as well as in our own offices and uh, computers and books is a question of how are we shaping the broader culture? And that comes down to mobilizing for education. It also comes down to mobilizing through culture. Now it's through media. It's through the uh, um, the spread and expanse of critical concepts and recognitions and the kind of Foucauldian analysis of power it has so shaped our discourse, right, for good and ill, as uh, I'm sure you can uh, speak more about. But it's this question of uh, how does uh, what we're doing in these classrooms have real relevance, not just for our students' immediate lives, but also for the kind of culture that we're creating. 
So one of the forms of what I consider to be advocacy, if not activism, was uh, engaging in a, a collaboration through the Religious Freedom Center in Washington, DC, which is a subset of the First Amendment Center, of which there are five. Thank you, Barrett. But the way in which the Religious Freedom Center is thinking about education and the need for religious literacy is uh, something that a series of master educators from high schools in Chicago in particular, as well as other academics um, from Harvard and Georgetown, and uh, Benjamin Marcus, who's been kind of convening this group. We got together and created national policy for the study of religion and mobilized the appropriate parties. The American Academy of Religion was the official author, and then we were all the kind of co-signatories. And now this is a part of the National Council of Social Sciences C3 framework, where we're thinking through what is it to be ready for college and civic engagement. And we say that the study of religion is vital for the way in which we are engaging the world around us. And yes, it is contested, and yes, it is a political issue, but it's an issue that won't go away. And so having this as part of national policy is one thing that we can do, and it shows the immediate effects of how what we're doing in our intellectual work and research is going to materially impact the way that we think about education. And then the challenge there is how do you get from national policy to individual classrooms and what teachers are trained to do, what teachers are trained to bring to the students, and what kind of resources they have to do this. There's the state level that gets in the way. <laughs> so for example, Texas is um, very opposed to the Common Core curricula, which is what the NCSS uh, framework is um, dealing with in terms of national standards. And so there's this tension between what is it that is now federally possible in terms of how we think about religion. Huge movements forward there because of the work of uh, Ben and others. And now the question is, how do we think on the local level? At the Bonnie Eek Institute here, we have uh, the wonderful uh, Zara Jamal and Gil Pagnani, who have been thinking through programming in the Houston Independent School District and trying to do a very similar thing. So I think that we need to be thinking about our public orientation as academics, as scholars, on multiple levels. We need to have the federal and national level. We need to have the local level in terms of pedagogy and practice. And uh, we need to mobilize all the states to actually take seriously the way that um, these forms of understanding of difference is really vital. I want to I want to say something good about technical language and defend elitism. Essentially, I think I think we're essentially an elite kind of uh, uh, professional. Um, but what strikes me as really odd about American society is that we honor elitism and technical language in all kinds of fields and don't think twice about it. When I go and get my Toyota truck worked on at the dealership and I talk to the mechanic, I have absolutely no idea what that guy is talking about. Uh, I, zero. He is talking nothing about anything I understand. And that doesn't bother me a bit. But I trust his expertise to work on my truck and keep me safe on the road. Same with a, a surgeon or a medical doctor. I have, I have virtually no idea what they're talking about, but I trust them. We, don't, we are not the recipients of that trust uh, in, in, this, in this bizarre culture that for some reason honors elite expertise in medicine and mechanics, but does not honor elite expertise in higher education or particularly the humanities. Um, I'm not defending that. I think that's kind of sad and pathetic, really. But I think that's the case. And I think when we start thinking about translating something like the study of religion into the public school systems, that's what essentially what we're going to run into, is a, is a profound distrust of our own expertise. And I think there are ways to do that. Uh, I think I know the work you and Gail and Zara have been doing here. It's very, it's very descriptive. You know, stick to description, stick to religious literacy, don't get into the sort of normative philosophical issues of what religion is and whether it's true or not. Just stick to describing, describing religious cultures fairly and comparatively, right? 
that can be done on a high school level. Yes. In terms of uh, what can be done programmatically, that is certainly the focus descriptively. However, the infrastructure, the reason why me, I'm a philosopher of religion, I'm an ethicist, I'm trained in the history of Christianity, what do I <laughs> contribute to this table? But I was the methods person who said, no, we need to think about the category of religion. How does the way in which we uh, uh, present this concept have implications for the way in which it's taught? 12th grade, 11th, 10th, 9th, kindergarten. And so then uh, we had to, you have to start with the philosophical. And like Wittgenstein says, right, an entire cloud of philosophy condensed into a drop of grammar. Right? It condenses downwards, and it becomes uh, actual lesson plans. But there's the continuity, the infrastructure. Otherwise, you don't have a coherent philosophy. You don't have a coherent um, approach. I really like your stress on the technical language and the embrace of elitism and expertise and how that's valued in society. Because if you go to the mechanic, you can evaluate their efficacy on the basis of the success. Does your car run or does it not? <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, if you go to the surgeon, are you alive after the fact? Are you not? Right? There are very straightforward outcomes. Like, is your knee working? Are you able to get around? Are you able to mobilize? So there's, in other words, a very clear sense of cause and effect. There's a sense of process and goal. Have you met that goal? With the humanities, there's a twofold problem, which is one, the goal is long term, and it is shaping minds. It is shaping hearts. It is shaping cultures. And we see the effects of this change only in the long term. And so there's one sense in which the effects of this kind of training, this kind of critical perspective, this kind of awareness of the world and all of its differences is only going to be able to transpire over time. You can only see the effects in a larger aggregate. And a lot of that will be qualitatively different than what you could quantify in terms of a religious literacy test, for example. If I can return to our metaphors, and Nikki, we're gonna we're gonna have to end here in a minute. But you know, we're really more we're really more pr like preventative medicine. We're telling people what to eat and how to live so they don't have a heart attack. Where you know the surgeon is treating someone who's already had a heart attack or is about to have one. Um, is that fair? You think? I think that's fair, and that connects to the second prong there, which is why we're deeply unpopular which is that we train people to critique the very systems of power that want to protect themselves, right? right? And so we're exposing things. We are showing that the surgeon is actually operating with all kinds of biases and that people are not treated uh, the same way. And so a black woman in surgery is treated very differently. And so the kind of um, health, public health outcomes are actually bound up in the way in which these broader cultural narratives allow themselves to present as objective, as objective knowledge, but they're not. And so what we're doing as humanists, as uh, social scientists often, is to show what the biases are in these putatively objective institutions and practices and show that they are contingent, they are not natural, and that they can be changed, which is threatening. We do build things. We do make cars run. We do engage in that kind of preventative uh, training and cultivation, not indoctrination, but instead helping the students make good on where they're coming from, what is it they care about, and how they're going to contribute. And we're doing it in a way that allows them to humanize themselves and humanize each other. And that is what leads to a sense of responsibility, not as the kind of bootstraps, but instead a responsibility to change yourself, to help change social norms, to help change policy and legality. And that is in order to make it so that equality is actually accessible. Equality in terms of race, in terms of gender, in terms of religion, where human rights are actually practiced instead of merely rhetorical. And that's both a threat and a promise. Nikki, that's a great place to stop. Thank you so much, Jeff. Right. Appreciate it. Bye -bye.